All righty. Uh, so chapter five, human movement science here. So uh, today's lesson, we are working our way through understanding some biomechanics, you know, how our design, our body is designed to move. We're going to start talking about some of these working pieces. Um, you know, we've gone through a little bit about the muscular system and the skeletal system and the nervous system. Um, you know, uh, that's our overall kinetic chain. And, you know, today we're really looking at like how the kinetic chain you know, actually produces human movement and interacts with the the sort of outside world here. So, uh, and that's kind of fun too. Like biomechanics is is this first definition we're going to see here, and it is really about how like you know we move our environment to interact with the world. You know, um, and that's that's really uh, <clears throat> uh, the kind of key here. So, after this presentation, we want you guys to be able to understand. Uh, biomechanic terminology. So that's some of the stuff we're going to look at today. So we are going to get some terms in like, um, you know, we have to have a very, very clear set of language uh, to describe like human movement, because like, we don't want to say move your arm up. Because that's actually not descriptive enough. Like if I said just like, hey, raise your arm. Right. It's like, well, that could be de determined, like I could raise it this way, I could raise it this way. I, could, I'm heck, I, I mean, technically, even this. I go behind me, right? That's still raising my arm. I'm just kind of going backwards, right? So now it's like, well, what do I, what, which one do I mean, right? Because um, if I say do shoulder raises and my client goes like this every time, they're not necessarily wrong, you know? Um, uh, or maybe they mean, you know, that, you know, it's like there's just too much room for interpretation. So we have to have a very clear language, uh, all of us that we can speak, um, that takes all the guesswork out of that language. You know, there is a difference between. Uh, what we call abduction, which would be this, versus shoulder flexion, which would be this, which is shoulder extension, which would be that, right? So each of those things are different. So we have to have like biomechanical terminology that's going to help us understand that. Uh, we need to understand our planes of motion. There's sort of three major categories in terms of human movement uh, and where they happen. So we'll look at the difference there. Uh, and then we'll do something really kind of fun today uh, when I ask. Uh, when we do that, uh, we'll look at some of the axes. We're really not going to look at axes today. This PowerPoint has that information, but like we'll kind of move through that pretty quickly. Um, joint motions, that's a really big one um, that, again, we're also going to move somewhat quickly through. Um, muscle actions, which is big. We want to understand the three main ways that our muscles contract. Um, that way we can understand that, like, you know, we know that our muscles shorten. But we also got to remember that they lengthen. Um, and so if two muscles are tied to like uh, uh, both sides of a, of a bone or both sides of a joint. Uh, when one is shortening, the other one is supposed to lengthen. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, it goops everything up and that's what we gotta talk about. Uh, so all of that is sort of the key stuff we're getting through today. Um, uh, and then we're gonna do like a quick primer on motor behavior at the very end. Um, so <clears throat> uh, human movement science, right? Uh, this is what we're talking about when we talk about kinesiology, right? So we got, you know, there's, there's biology, which is like, you know, the study of biologic organisms, kind of like, kind of like the cellular stuff, you know, um, there's anatomy, which is, uh, uh the science of, of labeling everything in the body. So we know, you know, what the difference between like, man, I don't know, teeth and bone is, you know, cause they're slightly different. One's made of, you know, um, uh, skeletal tissue and the other one's made of, I think, dentin. I don't know nothing about teeth, so I picked a bad example for myself to mention. Uh, <laughs> uh, you don't move these very much, so they're not exactly part of my <laughs> uh, skill base. Um, oh, we lost somebody again. Oh, we lost Eric again. Oh, no, we didn't. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> Who do we lose? Oh, we lost Marjan. <laughs> um, uh, there she is. Uh, we got to talk about... Um, uh, how our human movement system is going to not only be like aware of its external environment, but also aware of its internal environment and then how to move those things. Um, uh, and then, you know, our human movement system has to be able to like gather information about both of those things, right? Like none of us want to go grab like a five pound dumbbell and then lift it with a hundred pounds of force. You know what I mean? Like, cause then all the only next thing that's going to happen is, you know, it's just going to be, it's going to be exactly like those superhero movies where somebody gets superpowers for the first time and they just like rip the door off the hinges and they're like, what, you know, like, we don't want to do that. 
So we need to be able to gather information and interpret it very, 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 very quickly, which is, you know, luckily what our nervous system is very, very good at. Um, and then it produce the appropriate movement response. But oftentimes what will happen is we'll actually like collapse a joint down the wrong way. Uh, and that will cause us to often produce the wrong motor response. Um, I actually got, you know, th this is going to be kind of fun. I'm just going to start the, the, before we get into uh, uh, sort of the PowerPoint proper here, I'm just going to show you guys a video that popped up on my feed this weekend. Um, I know I show a lot of like squat university videos because that guy is like my like favorite physical therapist on YouTube, but he did such a cool breakdown this weekend um, that I got to show you this video real quick. Because um, I think it was just like, it was so analogous to like, you know, where people just understand, like, they're like, oh, well, you know, this is just how I move, right? Um, and I think this is just like a really, really cool breakdown here. Um, so I think he did like a full video. Uh, I'm just going to show you the Instagram a little bit here. But um, we're going to just, we're just going to check this out really quick. But this is all about like having flat feet, right? So feet flattening, we know is pretty dysfunctional um, to like proper human movement if it's like a very, very, very like, you know, developed thing. Now, obviously some people are born with like fallen arches. It's actually very common. Um, and so like they'll have flatter feet than, than others. Um, but this is actually a very, very interesting thing. Uh, and for those of you who remember uh, meeting up with me last time, you know that sometimes I will go on rants about shoes. Uh, this this uh, video kind of kind of goes into a similar concept. So here's a really cool um, video just to show you what a small biomechanical adjustment can do. That feet, notice how Travis's entire foot is touching the ground. There's no arch. And look how easy it is for his knee to cave in into excessive valgus. A lot of people who think they have flat feet just have very low arches that are poorly controlled, many times in part due to the position of the big toe because we wear narrow shoes. Now watch this. If I take this big toe and push it over a little bit wider, the position it would be within a wide toe box shoe, now open the hip up and then slowly bring your foot back down. You can see he now has an arch and he can control for it better just because the big toe is able to spread out. So if he got himself into a pair of wide toe box shoes and let his feet over time spread back out, he now has an arch that he can control better and control the position of his knee better whenever he's lifting. Do you have flat? That's a, he does a full detailed breakdown on the YouTube channel, uh, which is pretty cool. But look at like what happened. He took one little bone, right? I, I guess the, the, the I can't do that with my thumb right now. So we're going to say, oh my God, I got to <laughs> move my thumb over here. Uh, he took one little bone and just spread this out slightly, right? Uh, and that allowed like his entire foot to get more surface area contact, right? Like, because we do kind of want to have like three points of contact with our foot. We want to have like the outside, you know, the inside, and then like the heel. It makes this kind of really effective biomechanical triangle. Um, so by opening that toe up, uh, it made it much easier for him. And then he did have to move all the way up the kinetic chain. Like it wasn't just like, it, it wasn't like opening the toe fixed all of his problems. He did need to externally rotate his femur, right? Um, because we know that when the foot collapses in, um, we know that when the foot collapses in like this, it travels up the kinetic chain, right? Um, the whole thing is connected. So he fixed the toe, which allowed him to invert his foot more, okay? So what he was doing was excessive eversion of the foot. Um, uh, and that's this right here. Okay, eversion is uh, uh, flattening the foot sort of inward like this, right? Like the bottom of his foot's showing towards the inside. So by spreading his toe, actually allowed him to more invert his foot and show the, the sole of his foot more towards the outside rather, right? So instead of like collapsing in, he, it would be, he was able to like kind of flatten it back, you know, in the other direction, swing it the other way. And then that travels up the entire kinetic chain, right? Like when we see this, which is what we were seeing before. This is kind of an extreme drawing, right? 
Um, but like that, that, that travels all the way up here. There's a gaping sensation at the knee. There's a collapsing sensation on the other side of the knee. And then like this hip is rotating, right? So he did need to like, you know, he did need to get him to contract his glutes to swing the femur back out as well. It wasn't just like, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a magical fix or anything like that. Like, you know, it wasn't like turning a light switch on, but like, if he can learn how to like control that better, the entire kinetic chain, it's going to travel all the way up and it's going to make him a, a more effective athlete. It's going to make him have less aches and pains in life. Um, and it just goes to show you like how interconnected our entire kinetic chain is, you know, um, all of it is, is very connected and it does start at the feet. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about feet in my classes, um, because like they are found, they're our foundation, you know, um, uh, like, you know, it's great that you're putting a really beautiful roof on your house, but if the foundation for it is, is screwed up, like that house is going to fall down someday, you know? Um, and so, uh, uh, that's really what we're talking about. Like when we talk about like optimum movement. So I saw that video, like I woke up like Saturday morning to that video and I was like, I was like, this is going in my Monday lesson. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, by the way, if you do have that problem, if you do have like feet flattening, um, one of the other things that like, uh, you can somewhat do they, they are out there, you can get like sort of passive toe spreaders. So first things you're gonna need to do is like buy a shoe with a wider toe box. Um, first things you're going to need uh shoes that that allow your feet to actually expand so you don't end up with this problem right here like that is gonna get you um but you get a wider toe box uh and it can really have like a pretty you know a very positive effect you can see just like here it just whoops uh it just swings out more you know uh rather than being kind of collapsed in like that um and then I'm not a big fan of like passive tools usually. Like I've been, I don't know what happened to my news, my my uh, advertisement feed, but like lately, I think it's just, we look up so much posture stuff. I get so many ads guys for this little harness thing that you're supposed to wear that pulls your shoulders back. And then like, there's another one that I get for like a little thing you put on your back. And whenever it feels your, your back rounding, it zaps or it vibrates and like, it's like, hey, you're gonna you know, sit upright. I'm not a big fan of stuff like that, typically, because it does all the work for you. And I think that you should train for the work. However, um, if you're interested, there are little toe spreaders out there um, that you can wear while you're like sleeping, like as you go to bed. Um, and you can put just like a little tiny spreader in there and that can slowly pull that joint back into place. Uh, if you're somebody who has like a family history of like bunions, or if you have a bunion yourself, this uh, is a super effective uh, treatment for that. Um, so anyway, little mini bonus lesson within our, uh, our regularly scheduled lesson today. Um, uh, and really kind of sets us up to kind of understand this interconnectivity of uh, <clears throat> our kinetic chain. Well, my feed is flat. Yeah, uh, this is, might be something to look into, right? Um, yeah, uh, uh, try to work on that like spread, and it it can have a positive effect. Not gonna, not saying it's gonna you know fix all your problems overnight, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have flat feet and you have like if if you have like a history of bunions as well, if you feel like that big toe, you'll even sometimes be able to spot it if your big toe is like kind of you know collapsing over the your your yeah. so if it looks like that uh those toe spread that could be you know and they're like they're like 10 bucks on amazon i wouldn't get the ones uh i have seen i just saw them actually uh i wouldn't get one of these um the ones that like are like a full freaking loop like i like these personally or like honestly the big toe is the big problem so my favorite one is just this one um, these little tiny itty bitty ones. I would not do this. These like webbing things, because uh, I've seen I've had people complain. Like they'll put them on when they go to bed, and like that's like it, it's just like so much surface area that it can like cut off blood flow. <laughs> and then like you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, ouch, you know. Um, so I would probably avoid those. 
Um, but yeah, something to look into. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at uh, uh, our, some of our definitions here. So biomechanics, big thing we're talking about today, right? Um, the motions that your kinetic chain produces, uh, as well as the forces that are acting upon it. So um, another, the way this used to be defined, actually in my, in my book, it used to be, uh, it is the study of how the body interacts with outside forces, which I always thought was a little bit more elegant, but um, <laughs> it is basically how like, you know, our body is able to produce movement and, and move around, right? Information has got to come in, we've got to produce, you know, we've got to uh, interpret that information and then produce the appropriate response. But if we get bad information coming in, you know, because maybe a muscle is, is chronically shortened. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's the, 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 the example I always use is like my mom, like my mom always has money on her and my dad and I both know that, but it's so funny. Like it, it's, it's like her super emergency fund. And my mom does like, you know, quick mom math in her head. Whenever my dad's like running short on cash, he's like, do you get 20 bucks? And my mom will be like, and it's like, this isn't a real emergency. And she goes, nah, I got nothing on me. And like other times we'll be, and my dad will be like, oh God, like they, it's cash only. And my mom's like, I got you. And she'll always like have it. So my mom's a liar. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, a good one, you know. <laughs> um, but like, she's very sneaky because she needs to be. She's got to keep my dad in check. Um, <laughs> And that kind of happens in your body all the time. You get this muscle that says, no, I can't possibly stretch any further. We're already at maximum length. I can't stretch any further, right? Because it gets used to being chronically in a shortened position. It gets so used to staying short, staying con you know, partially contracted, that it's sending a system, you know, your nervous system starting to go, I thought this muscle was was this long, but I, I guess, I guess it's only this long, you know, and it, our brain learns that new posture and it gets used to it. Right. And that becomes like the new misinformation. So if that happens, well, then as you try to move through like a specific range of motion and, you know, maybe that one muscle should relax to facilitate that range of motion, it doesn't happen. So then all of a sudden you get somebody who, you know, they go to try to raise their arm up overhead. And then this is as far as they can go because maybe their lat is saying, no, I couldn't possibly stretch any further. You know, this is as long as I get when in reality, it should be able to go to here and they should be able to get that arm all the way up overhead. Right. Um, but we see it. We see these alterations in people's posture all the time. So we as fitness professionals need to be able to communicate together um, to understand like what the proper movement patterns are um, in order for us to understand like how to fix them. Right. So like we need to have a very specific language that we can all speak um, that takes out the 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 misinterpretation. Right. Um, so we're going to see a lot of terms today for my new folks. Uh, this is going to be a very like definition heavy day. Um, this is a this is like a flashcard day is a really good day. Like if you're going to make some flashcards is a really great spot for it. Um, if that's like a way that you happen to learn, or if it's just a way, or if it's a way that you haven't really goofed around with yet, uh, this is where I kind of recommend it. And it's just getting very familiar with this terminology. Um, so let's talk about some of these anatomic locations, because we don't want to say something is above something else. Because then like, you know, um, like you'd probably all agree, you know, in general, if I just said like, you know, your head is above everything else in your body, you'd probably be like, yeah, I mean, that makes the most sense, right? Head's at the very top. Um, but like, there's always going to be that one, you know, that one kid in school who would always go, well, what about when this happens, right? Like, uh, they love to like mess with their teacher by doing that. I, I was often that kid. Uh, <laughs> where it's like, what if I was standing on my hands, then my head would be at the bottom of my body. Yeah, that's very true. However, um, we are going to take that argument away and make sure that it can't happen by having what is known as the anatomic position. So if I'm referring to something, 
If I refer to something as flexion or extension, or if I say it's superior or inferior or lateral or medial, right? What I mean is I am always referring to it. I don't care what position the body is in right now. Uh, what I care is where that location that I'm describing is during the anatomic position, okay? So the anatomic position is gonna take any of that misinterpretation away. And it is this position right here. It is standing straight up with your arms at your sides, toes pointing, this is kind of got a little bit of an angle here, but toes pointing straight forward uh, and palms facing forward, okay? So the classic anatomic position uh, uh, is, is this, right? It's literally just standing upright, feet shoulder width apart, not abducted, not standing in like a big Y with a wide stance or like that, basic stance, right? Straight forward. So if I say something is superior, it doesn't mean when my client is standing on their hands, right? It doesn't mean when they're, you know, tilted at the side, right? This it's reads, I'm saying it's superior when they are in this position right here, where it's inferior when they are in this position right here. Everything I refer to is in the anatomic location, okay? So let's go ahead and look at some of these, uh, some of these terms here. I'm gonna put this guy over here. So I got room, put him over there. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you how we kind of like to do this. I'm gonna try something new today. For those of you who have already heard this lesson before, I'm trying a little bit of a different take today. Uh, <laughs> so, um, all right. So uh, the other nice thing, guys, uh, is when it does come to memorizing this stuff and learning this terminology, um, it really helps to learn them and their opposites, learn them in pairs, because every, every like direction has an anti-direction, right? You know, if something is left, you get the right. If something's up, you got down, right? So it's very easy to kind of memorize these things uh, together, okay? So um, first two, first two we're going to see uh, are superior and inferior, okay? So superior, and actually that reminds me, you know what? I don't need, well, actually, yes, I do. Uh, let me put a little line through this guy here real quick. Uh, he's not, uh, <laughs> He's not perfectly symmetrical. Uh, all right, and then another line here. And we'll put another one like right here. Okay, so uh, uh, first two we're gonna look at are superior and inferior. So I want you to imagine like, you can kind of picture this circle over here with like uh, the line going through the center uh, in both directions, right? So, and that that really quickly, um, I also just, this definition isn't part of today's like, it's not one of the definitions in your book, but we just need to have a difference. We need to have like a conversation really quickly about the difference between center and middle. Center and middle are not the same thing. Center is where two middles meet. So middle, there are two middles, right? There's the horizontal middle, right? Which is this one, right? The middle of the horizontal section would be like right here. Then there's the vertical middle, right? Which would be this one. So like, you know, this is in the middle of the vertical part of the circle. This is in the middle of the horizontal part of the circle where those two middles meet, that's the center, okay? That definition sometimes throws, like that sometimes is just like a, a little language thing that we run into every now and then. So, um, all right, so let's talk about superior. So superior is going to be a position above a point of reference. So the head is superior to the rest of the body, okay? So superior is above and inferior is exactly the opposite. That is a position below a point of reference. So if you imagine anything above the horizontal line uh, would be considered superior, okay? Um, so we'll say uh, above the line. Right. And then inferior uh, is going to be below the line. OK, so that's uh, inferior. Um, so 
Uh, again, we'll see like superior is going to be up here, right? And inferior is going to be down here, right? Um, so that's superior, and this will be inferior, OK? Uh, next one we've got, we've got a position that I can't do on the circle here. Uh, we've got uh, uh, a position on the front of the body. So I'll just kind of do like a, uh, yeah, I can't really draw 3D, but we'll do almost like a sort of a rotation on the front here. Uh, that's going to be considered anterior. So that's the front. Uh, and then posterior will be the back. Okay, so we'll kind of go uh, uh, on this side, right? So that's uh, uh, posterior. That's another thing my parents used to do. When my mom was a kid, you know, or when my mom was a kid, good Lord. When I was a kid, my mom uh, would threaten me and she'd be like, you are going to have a bruised posterior if you do not start behaving. <laughs> and that was her, you know, nice way of, of warning me. <laughs> Yeah, what's up, Marjan? Question. <clears throat> what you got? Marvin. Um, but oh, no, <laughs> oh my God. I'm so sorry. I glanced so quickly. I no problem. Like, I just like hit the button. Yeah, sorry. What's up, Marvin? Is uh, anterior considered the same as frontal? Yes. Uh, oh, uh, are, um, you, you're probably, you might be thinking of the frontal plane. Um, so, yeah. No, that's, so no. That's exactly it. Yes. So uh, we'll get into planes in a bit here. Um, but you can see like uh, like the uh, the frontal plane is where you can see an anterior and posterior section. So yes, it would be like that's where the terminology comes from because it'd move about the axis, right? So then it would be if you have an, an anterior section and a posterior section like this, You'd be able to move between those two so that's why frontal plane movements are movements where you can see the front or if somebody was standing behind me the back right but like if you were standing directly in front of me um and let's say i got my arms like this it's almost hard to tell that i'm going like front to back that's because that's sagittal right so um so frontal plane movement yeah they're connected terminology wise um because uh, you can see the anterior and posterior sections, um, and you would move along them that way. Um, and that is where those terms come from. But they are very disconnected. Like, this is just a, a location on the body versus, like, where primary movement happens. So they are kind of separate, too. Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Um, oh, man, that's a, that was a tough question to answer, actually. I was like, how do I? <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So, um, so those are, so, so if we're talking, we give some examples here, right? So your head is very superior. Uh, uh, and then like, you know, um, your feet are very inferior. Now, a lot of times when we use this terminology, we'll often describe it in relation to something else. So like your head is superior to everything else. Right. Um, but I could say like, uh, your pelvis, right here, uh, you know, the, those two pelvic bones is inferior to your rib cage, which would be up here, even though it is superior to like the rest of your legs, right? So just inferior is whatever's below something else, right? My nose is inferior to my forehead, you know, because it's below it. Um, even though my, my forehead is inferior to the hat that I'm wearing, you know what I mean? Um, so if you, if you give it a second thing, you have to describe it in relation to that. So anterior is on the front, posterior is on the back. Um, sometimes those are called uh, uh, um, ventral and dorsal, by the way, but we don't usually hear those terms that often. Uh, ventral is the front and dorsal is on the back. Um, that's actually easier to remember if you remember, if I, actually, if I write dorsal, we'll probably just get a picture of people's backsides here. Yeah. <laughs> um, it'll be a lot of pictures on the back. But uh, if I type in dorsal fin, you know, it's the fin that's uh, on the back of a fish or the, the fin on the back of a shark or whatever it happens to be, a whale, a dolphin. Um, so it's the backside. Um, so dorsal. Um, <clears throat> uh, so then we've got uh, uh, anterior posterior so you got medial which is a position nearer the midline and this is the nearer the 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 middle 
right? Not center. Um, but this is a position near the mid line. So this is going to be a uh, medial, right? Um, Cause it's closer and this is a, this is a, a vertical midline, right? Whereas like lateral is going away from that midline. Okay, so lateral, uh, we're gonna go like this. That's going away from it. So there's lateral. Um, or again, right, if I go, um, you know, towards my midline, that would be medial. Um, and if I go away from my midline, right, we'll go just kind of across the line and go towards the outside. Uh, that's going to be considered a lateral. Um, so uh, two different ways that we kind of drew that here, right? One, I'm, I'm moving close to it, but if I crossed over and start going past the other way, right? I'm like, like medial, 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 medial. I cross my midline, lateral, 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 lateral. That's why these are called lateral raises because you're moving the dumbbell away from your midline. Um, and by the way, this only moves in a horizontal fashion. So when we're talking about medial and lateral, I want you to think like, side shuffle, right? It's only lateral movement, right? Um, obviously it could be happening, you know, they could be offset, you know, but um, it only moves side to side. Uh, just like superior and inferior was, was a, it only moves up and down. So medial and lateral are kind of like a moving sidewalk and superior and inferior is kind of like an elevator, right? It goes up and down, the other one goes side to side. Um, but then uh, we got some weird ones here. We got two weird terms. We've got proximal versus distal. And this is where the conversation about centers come in because this can move in multiple directions. So if I am going closer to the center, right? And that's where the two middles meet. That is within proximity to the center. So that's proximal. Uh, and if I'm going away from my center, that is going to be considered distal. I am uh, getting uh, 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 at a distance, right? Yeah, question. Um, can you show us the uh, proximal and distal um, example? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got you, right? Uh, I get so confused with this proximal totally. and distal. Um, so proximal, right? So here's easy, the easiest way to remember these. Um, and I kind of, this is kind of getting a little messy on this picture over the, on the guy here, but one of the easiest way to remember this is like, go to the arms, right? Let's say I'm going, if I'm drawing a line from my center and I travel like down the arm, right? I had to travel a pretty long distance there. So that would be considered distal, okay? I had to really travel uh, to kind of get there, right? Whereas like, if I go closer to my center, that is gonna be considered proximal. So if I go like here, right, nearest the center, that's within proximity, so proximal, right? Um, so the way this, the way that like proximal and distal work is like they're kind of filling in, um, they're kind of filling in the, the missed, um, they're kind of filling in the missed locations, right? Because like, if we only had like, we would have to say, and, and you actually will hear these terms like in people who just don't want to say proximal and distal, um, but you'll sometimes hear like, let's say something is, uh, actually my no, my eyeball is a really good example, right? Let's say we're going from my nose uh, up to my eye, right? So I had to go superior and lateral. So you would hear somebody say, your eyes are superolateral to your nose which is kind of just like a weird term to use because you have to put like two directions together. So instead we have distal, which is like, you know, they're away this way and they're, they're up. So it's, it's two movements simultaneously. So like while medial and lateral are like a moving sidewalk and they just go side to side like this and superior inferior is like a ladder, is like a, a, an elevator going up and down. Um, proximal and distal are kind of like an escalator. It goes forward and up or downward and, <laughs> and forward, <laughs> um, right? It's like <laughs> the analogy broke at, this, at the last second there. Um, usually though, Marjan, the only time you're ever gonna hear proximal and distal are when we talk about the arms, uh, the arms and legs, right? Most of the time. So um, 
let's say uh, uh, which part of my arm is the most distal. Well, how far would you have to travel from my fingertips back to my midline versus my elbow? This would be traveling, this would take longer to travel from my fingers yeah. all the way to my center than my elbow would. So this is at, this is more distal and this is more proximal. Oh, okay. Right, but then obviously all of that changes in relation to like the context. So I didn't give you any context, then you're just going to assume uh, that I mean my center, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but if I did give you context, I would say, you know, which is more proximal to the wrist. So now you're gonna have to be like, well, how many inches away from the wrist is the elbow versus the fingertips? And it's like proximal. And I said to the wrist. So then it's like, oh, I'm not talking about my center. Now I'm talking about the wrist. Right. So my fingers are closer and my elbow is further in this case. So the, um, the example- that means, the, the, that means your elbow is a distal of your wrist. Yes, to my wrist, right? Yeah. Whereas if I didn't say, you know, if I deleted that sentence, I was, I was which of the following is more proximal? I didn't say anything. Yeah. I didn't say it to the okay. wrist. Then you would immediately assume, go to the center of the body. Go, okay. Yeah. So it is a little contextual sometimes, which, you know, it can be confusing. Um, Cause often the re and the reason it's confusing is not because the definitions are confusing. Like I'll, I, I'll bet you know the definitions super well, but sometimes the way people construct their sentences um, are confusing because you're like, that's a weird way to phrase that. But what I think you mean is this, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's where I always get into trouble because I like, um, you know, because I'm like, do you mean this or do you mean this? Um, so then uh, we got two terms here uh, that are unique. They're not necessarily direct locations, um, but this is where, uh, uh, we have contralateral and ipsilateral. So this is kind of a fun one. Um, uh, I can't really put these into like a drawing necessarily. I, I guess I could. Let's try this. So, um, so this, I'm going to put this arrow connected. Um, this would be considered what we call contralateral. Uh, and contralateral, think the word contradict. Um, uh, contralateral is uh, opposite, right? Um, so if you have the opposite opinion that I do and you are contradicting what I say, right? Um, that would be contra, your, our opinions would be contralateral, you know? Um, uh, uh, so it is your left hand versus your right hand. They are on opposite sides. So they're contralateral versus your left hand, uh, which is on the same side as your left foot. That is what we consider to be ipsilateral. Those terms actually don't get used that often. The only time, it, well, at least ipsilateral doesn't really get used that often. Um, the only time we ever really use it is when we're talking about where to hold a dumbbell. Uh, we usually tell people like hold it in the contralateral hand and that keeps you balanced. So like, you know, let's say I'm doing a, a I got a dumbbell in one hand and I'm doing like a single leg deadlift. Uh, if I hold it in the ipsilateral side, that actually opens up my hip as I go into that single leg deadlift, which now I'm like loading all one side, which is allowing me to rotate and move in a way that's pretty ineffective. So we'd say, don't hold the dumbbell here, hold it in the contralateral hand. And then because it crosses over my midline, it balances me out. And now my hip isn't opening like this, it's staying level. <clears throat> oh God. Um, so that's, that's uh that's contra that, that's the only time we ever use contralateral we just say it's like hey hold it's the opposite side arm um so uh one more time just to go through all those terms really quickly and, and see them one more time we have got um superior which is above whatever we're referencing and if we're not referencing anything then we assume uh the midline we've got inferior which is below whatever we're referencing and if we don't reference anything, it's below the midline. Uh, anterior, which is on the front. Posterior, which is on the back. Um, medial, which is uh, towards the midline. Lateral, which is away from the midline. 
uh, uh, proximal, which is nearest the center or nearest whatever it is I'm referencing, uh, distal, which is uh, further from the center or further from whatever it is I'm referencing, uh, and then contralateral, which is on the opposite side of something else, and ipsilateral, uh, which is on the same side uh, uh, of something else, right? Um, so those are sort of our directional terms as they exist. Uh, any questions on that, guys, <coughs> before we move into the next one? Mm -hmm. No, I'm good. Thank you all that. All right. Uh, okay, so. Uh, <laughs> It's like a big scroll on that one. Let's take a look at our planes of motion. So, um, so the next thing we got to kind of look at is we're actually going to divide the body again, only this time um, we're dividing it uh, into these three kind of primary sections that are kind of describing like the three primary places that we move. Um, there's actually more complicated versions of this out there. Um, you can actually see there's a picture of like, you can see like the mid sagittal and the parasagittal. Um, we don't really need those terms. Um, so uh, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at these three primary planes of ocean here. And they are all at right angles to one another. Where's the good picture that I like? There it is. This is the one that's in your textbook. <laughs> um, in fact, actually, this is on NASM's website, which Makes me wonder why it's so pixelated. Come on, NASM. <laughs> uh, focus. <laughs> oh, you know what? We can use this one. This isn't bad. Okay. Um, so here are three planes of motion, right? And then uh, 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 this is actually another kind of interesting way to lay it out. Um, and it kind of just, just shows you the two sections that you're sort of divided into, right, um, in, in each plane. So uh, we're going to see three planes of motion, three primary places that we move. So now kind of start thinking about human movement and breaking it down into three categories, right? So we've got categories of stuff that move this way, right, front to back movements, right, if I'm swinging my leg or bending my elbows. Right, even just like pointing my toe and then like flexing my toe. Like I'm just going front to back, right? This way, this way, this way. Oh, I don't want to do too much of that right now. Uh, whoo! <laughs> also, you guys just see me just like pass out. <laughs> um, all right, not doing too much sagittal plane movements today. Uh, <laughs> then we got frontal plane movements. Imagine me doing stuff like this side to side, right? Uh, and then we got transverse movements. Think of them as twisting actions, okay? So those are kind of the three types of movements we have because those are the three uh, uh, primary areas in which we are moving, right? So if, and here's what's kind of confusing about this. We're gonna start with the confusing one, um, the frontal plane. Uh, so Marvin, this is what you're just asking about, right? This is the confusing plane because or at least I was very confused by this when I first started studying. Um, the frontal plane will divide you into front and back portions. So it's this one right here that kind of cuts you down the middle uh, until you have a front half and a back half, right? So this is the frontal plane right here. 50% of your mass is in the back side, 50% of it is on uh, the front side. Now. Here's how you got to think about these planes of movement. They move with the cut, okay? So they move with like this little line that's dividing you into front and back halves. So that means that frontal plane movements are not movements that go front to back. They are movements that go side to side which I find very confusing. <laughs> but remember like the plane is opposite of its axis. And that, that's why if you go to back to, and I can't teach, I'm, I can't teach you guys geometry because I'm not a math teacher. <laughs> you, you want a 12 year old teaching you geometry before you want me to do it. <laughs> um, but planes and axes are opposite. They're, they're at right angles, okay? So 
um, the frontal plane, yes, is going uh, to divide us uh, this way, right, into a, a, a front side and a back side. And I'm going to move with the plane. So a frontal plane movement is anything where I'm moving like this, you know? Um, you guys ever see those, uh, those window cleaners where, like, you know, uh, you're in, like, a 12-story building and you can't, like, you know, it's very dangerous to reach outside. So they give you those like little magnet things. And it's like, you put a magnet on one side and a magnet on the other and you use it to like scrub your window because they stay connected. You're moving with like, but you can't, if you pull the magnet this way, it detaches it so then it would fall, right? So you got to stay with the glass, right? That's kind of how the frontal plane works, right? It's anything that kind of stays with the plane of motion, okay? So frontal plane movements, are side to side movements oftentimes, right? Um, so that is gonna be like side shuffling. This is a frontal plane movement because I'm moving with the plane, right? Uh, leg raises like this, that's a frontal plane movement, right? Lateral raises, that's a frontal plane movement. Uh, tilting my head side to side, like bobbing my head, right? That's a frontal plane movement. So I know it doesn't move, front and back, which is somewhat confusing, um, but that's because it has to move with the plane. You should be able to see the front and the back. So abduction, which is this motion right here, is a frontal plane movement, and adduction is this uh, type of movement right here where I'm adding it uh, back to my body, right? Um, and that's the two major things that happen in that plane. So terms that we're going to use we're going to be describing abduction and adduction. Adduction is whenever you are adding something medially. So a pull-up actually, let, let's say I'm doing a pull-up here. I got a pull-up bar right here and I pull down like this, right? Notice how my arm here is being added towards my midline. So a pull-up is actually considered adduction and a shoulder press is considered abduction because my arm is moving away from my midline. It's easier to see with like lateral raises, right? That's abduction. My arms are being abducted by aliens, right? <laughs> uh, and then if I were adding them back to my body, that's adduction. So um, those are the two major movements that exist in the frontal plane, abduction and adduction. What we often see, remember how our go-to example on Friday or was it Thursday? Uh, we were talking about knees cave in. Right, we see that client who, you know, uh, uh, excessively like, you know, um, there's somebody who made the same drawing I did, right? We saw that knee valgus, right? What we were seeing was excessive adduction of the knee. If I type knee adduction, that's a knee cave in posture, right? Um, which is going to put too much pressure. There it is. That's the picture I want. Uh, it's going to put too much pressure on the outside portion of the bone because this is collapsing and it's creating a gaping on the inside. That's adduction of the knee. It should stay in alignment, right? This is act actually, you know what? This is actually too much. This is too much abduction. So they got the, the two bad examples here. Um, they're doing it on purpose, but this is knee valgus, which is adduction of the femur. And then there is knee varus as well, um, bow-legged posture, which is excessive abduction. Right. If I were walking around like a cowboy, right? Just like walking into town like this, right? That is knees caving out. That's excessive abduction. But also, if I were walking around like this with my knees caved in, right? That's excessive adduction. So um, we're going to be looking at that this module. We're going to see. Uh, how, we're going to we're going to train our, our eyeballs <laughs> to be able to spot people who do too much adduction and too much abduction. Um, so that's the frontal plane. 
And then we got the sagittal plane, which is 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 uh, dividing us into left and right halves. So the sagittal plane uh, uh, cuts us like this uh, here on the far uh, the far left here, right? So 50% of the body mass is on the left side, 50% of it is on the right side. So I, if I were moving with that plane, right, I'd be moving front to back. So sagittal movements are ones that go like this, right? My head going this way or going this way, right? Crunching forward or backwards, right? Uh, bicep curls, tricep extensions, uh, that is very sagittal. Okay, um, so this divides us into left and right halves. So we call this, where I am uh, going this way, we call that flexion. And if I'm going this way, we call that extension, right? So that's flexion versus extension. Uh, flexion versus extension. So bicep curls are, are uh, uh, where you're doing elbow flexion. Tricep extensions are, well, <laughs> where you are doing elbow extensions. Uh, the leg extension machine is knee extension. Uh, when I am doing a squat, which should be your most, this is the most famous uh, example. The squat is sometimes referred to as triple extension, actually. Um, and if I type that, triple extension, what you'll see uh, are, exercises that are like sprints. There's the man himself, um, right? That's a good example of triple extension. Why is it considered triple extension? Well, look at his front leg, which is the, this is the preload section of a run, right? Um, so he's not, he's not pushing against resistance here. He's sort of anti doing it, right? So he's in hip flexion because it's coming up, right? He's in knee flexion. And he's in ankle. Uh, this is a special movement uh, for my new folks. We'll we'll come to this term later. Uh, he's in ankle. What we call dorsi flexion. Um, so all three of those, right? Now, as soon as he starts pushing against that, and he's concentrically like shortening the muscle when he pulls on the muscle, he is going to hip extend. He's going to knee extend. And he's going to ankle extend, uh, which we call, and this is very confusing when you're new, uh, we call that planter flexion, but he's planting his foot. Um, so that's triple extension, one extension, two extensions, three extensions. So that's what a squat is, um, or like um, you can see here, uh, uh, that's also what we refer to when we're talking about um, uh, um, it snatches or cleans or anything like that. But a squat is a triple extension movement. It's three places where you are extending all at once or even like a kettlebell swing as well. So that's why so many like athletes train for triple extension because so many sports involve like sprinting. Uh, and that's why we love squats so much. <laughs> so the basic versions, flexion or extension. Um, and then lastly, we've got the transverse plane. Uh, and the transverse plane are twisty movements. So uh, if I've got 50% of my mass above and 50% of it below, anything that's gonna sort of like spin along the axis there is a transverse movement. So my head spinning, right? We're going this way, right? That's transverse motion. Or just taking my wrist. It would be resting down here. So spinning my shoulder or spinning my forearm, right? Anything that's spinning, because uh, uh, again, you got to remember the two magnets, right? They got to stay connected to one another, right? So they can't move this way because if I moved it too far this way, it would fall, right? So spinning actions, those are transverse movements, okay? Um, so internal rotation versus external rotation. Uh, rotating towards the midline or rotating away from the midline, that is transverse motion. So this would be shoulder internal rotation because if I were standing in the anatomic position, right, I'd be rotating towards my midline. Uh, so this is internal rotation. This is external rotation. I'd be swinging away from my midline. Um, 
And then there is one uh, special term here. Uh, what about like what we just described? What about the side to side stuff? Well, if I were moving towards my midline, right? We're gonna, I'm adding it to my midline, right? So that is horizontal adding adduction. So normal adduction was up and down, right? I added to my midline or I abducted away from my midline. So this is horizontal instead of vertical. So I'm horizontally adducting or horizontally abducting, okay? And that is basically all the main movements. I'm not super worried about those movements this module, um, but I do want you to definitely be familiar with these three planes of movement. Sagittal, right? Frontal and transverse. Yeah, what's up, Marvin? So since there's horizontal adduction and abduction, is there such thing as a vertical adduction and abduction or is that just normal adduction, abduction? Uh, that would be just normal adduction, abduction. Okay. Yep. Good question. Yeah. Um, so uh, those are our three planes of movement. So every movement you've got um, is uh, happening in a plane of movement. So here's a fun thing. Everybody get ready to unmute your microphones. I'm going to go around the room. Um, I'm going to go around the room here and we're going to generate a list. All right. So uh daryl i'm gonna start with you because you're um, you're on my screen you're on the top uh give me an exercise in the gym pick an exercise um lateral row lateral row you mean like a wide grip row okay <laughs> yeah love that all right uh marjan give me a give me an exercise Oh, Marjan, you're you're muted. I'm thinking. <laughs> ah, gotcha, gotcha. Um, they don't have to be a good exercise, by the way. Just something you've seen in the machine. You could lay, name a machine in the gym, for instance. Just any exercise. I mean, a fun little thought experiment. <laughs> um. Oh my god. Okay, give me time. I'm got. I'm. Like, here's the thing, when you say something right away, I get uh, nervous. <laughs> okay, like... I'll give you a little bit of a parameter. Give me a, an, give me a leg exercise. Um, I'll make it a little easier. Uh, Name God. a leg machine in the gym. I don't know. <laughs> Um, uh, all right, Simon, give me a, give me, give me a, any exercise, any, any exercise that exists. Uh, dumbbell chest flow. All right, Marvin, give me an exercise. Uh, barbell, <clears throat> barbell sumo squat. Nice. Cyrus, give me an exercise. Uh, uh, any exercise? Any exercise. Oh, bench press. Big bench press. Uh, oh, who? I think Julio's. Julio's at work. We'll leave. We'll we'll leave you alone, Julio. <laughs> Eric. Uh, Eric, give me an exercise. Uh, calf extensions. All right. Alex, oh Alexis, I think you're podcasting as well, if I remember right. Uh, <laughs> if you can mute, go for it. But Alyssa, give me an exercise. <laughs> I know a couple people are sort of on mute the whole time. Alyssa, I'm not sure. You're usually an evening person. You might be on that list as well. Um, okay, so let's take a look and we're going to analyze what planes these are in. So, because here's the thing, there are going to be multiple joint actions here. Oh, I see a chat bubble. Oh, Alexis with the burpees. Love that. Uh, that's tough. Um, by the way, don't feel bad if you're having trouble like thinking about stuff. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen 
podcasting. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have ever seen, uh, uh, his name's Billy on the street. He's this guy who goes around and he just has like a really intense energy. <laughs> he goes and asks people questions and it literally just goes to show you how hard it is to think of something when someone like shines a light on you and is like, think of this. Um, this is why they like, literally, this is why like, uh, like the Miranda rights like exist is because like human as human beings, we are very bad at explaining things to ourselves, which is why like if you're ever pulled over, just, you know, like very quiet, like answer as simply as possible and do as little talking as you can, because <laughs> you will often say things or not say things that you should, you know, normally be able to think of. Um, but he literally at one point he goes around and he looks at, a, he goes to a woman and he goes, name a woman. And she's like, uh, <laughs> like, and she literally can't like, just a, a like she could say herself, you know, <laughs> like, but like it, it's what happens to our brain. This is why Mo's going to work with you guys on like test prep, because moments like this are very stressful to, to human brains. <laughs> um, so a lateral row, right? If we say like this version of a row, okay. So what's happening, we've got three, uh, oh, well, we got two joints that are moving, okay? We've got our shoulder and we've got our elbow. So we got two joints that are moving. So a lateral row would be what we call horizontal abduction, right? In the shoulder, that's horizontal abduction and elbow flexion. So those two things are happening simultaneously. So that's what's happening in this version of a row, okay? Uh, whereas like if I describe like this row, let's say I'm doing like a seated row, it's a different movement. It's still elbow flexion, that part's the same, but now it's shoulder extension instead of horizontal abduction. So horizontal abduction actually only exists in your shoulder, which is nice. Um, that makes it a little easier to understand. But this version of a row, yeah, a dumbbell chest fly, only one joint is moving for the most part. So uh, that's actually kind of the opposite there. So whoever, <laughs> that's kind of funny. We got two movements here that are kind of like the antithesis of each other. Uh, uh, the dumbbell chest fly is horizontal abduction. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, adduction. Whoops, <laughs> forgot where I was. Um, so that one's adding to my midline whereas this row was going away from my midline. So horizontal adduction versus horizontal abduction. The barbell sumo squat. Um, so this is gonna be many joints simultaneously, right? We got three, three joints to look at here. So a barbell sumo squat, sumo squat, right? Not sumo dildo. So I'd have the barbell on my back here and I would have a really wide stance, right? And then my toes would be going away. So what's happening here is I got a lot of joint action simultaneously as I squat down, right? So first at the hip, I have, instead of a normal squat, which would just be me going straight forward, my feet are wider and my foot is turned away. So when I turn my foot away, that is going to be femoral, because it's my femur, external rotation, and then during the squat, I am doing uh, uh, hip extension. And then at the knee, I am doing knee extension. And at the ankle, I'm doing ankle. I'm going to write ankle extension here, which those of you who have, that doesn't exist, but for my new folks, uh, that's plantar flexion. Okay. Um, I need to make these, this, this chart's getting more complicated <laughs> by the second. So I'm going to put these in bold. <laughs> Question. Um, is it also like, um, what is it, would it be like, um, adduction as well with that? It actually, yeah. Uh, good point. I uh, kind of forgot about that one. Yeah, absolutely. Cause when you be coming up, um, yeah, uh, it would be adding, to your midline. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good point. <laughs> um, that's why it works your adductors. 
um, hip adduction. So now, I mean, really, this is a triple plane movement at this point, um, which is why a lot of people really like uh, sumo squats and sumo deadlifts. Um, they are a really good way to kind of build in that inner thigh. Um, and they are kind of a good way to fix like a client who's like a knee, um, you know, like a knee cave outer. Um, this can be like a good movement to work on that. However, um, if they're in knee cave outer, um, this also is kind of bad for it at the same time because of the femoral external rotation. Um, so like by swinging, you know, they already have too much external rotation. So instead I would say go with like a sumo deadlift for a client like that. Cause they can have a little bit less of it. Um, but, uh, and if you have a client whose knees cave in this, because it is hip adduction, this might not be so great for that. Um, cause then they would be getting even better at, you know, adding in and caving the knees in, um, uh, which is kind of funny because we, we do want to encourage abduction, you know, um, that's why you see so many trainers do the resistance band around the knee thing. Cause then they have to push externally. Whereas with this exercise, they're kind of pulling internally. Um, uh, next one we got is bench press. Um, so bench press, right. We're going here and we're going to press that away. So that's going to be for the shoulder. Uh, horizontal adduction again. So the bench press and the chest fly are both kind of doing the same thing at the shoulder joint, right? See my shoulder here? It's going this way. Well, my shoulder's still going there. It's just now I'm bending my wrist. So that's going to be horizontal adduction plus um, elbow extension. Calf extensions, uh, it's kind of an easy one because uh, it's one single joint. It's one joint at a time. So guess what? That's, uh, that's going to be ankle extension, which we call plantar flexion. Okay, Gets a special name. Uh, just for those of you who are new, the ankle gets a lot of special names. It's the only part of the body that comes out at a right angle. The rest of your body is like stacked this way. So because that comes out at an angle like this, <laughs> you know, your feet are come out that way. Uh, I guess technically your nose does that as well, but for the most part, like everything is kind of stacked this way. Um, so it has to have a special name because it kind of fits outside of all of these clear definitions. So they call it plantar flexion versus dorsiflexion. Um, and that's just kind of a special term. The ankle has a lot of special terms. And then burpees, man, this is going to be a lot of movements. Um, so Burpees is a lot. It's all the same stuff as a regular squat, um, plus uh, a, a bunch of stuff in like, you know, the shoulders and elbows and stuff. So what's kind of funny about a burpee is it's a push up plus all the normal squat stuff. So we're going to do all the normal squat stuff. We'll say ankle plantar flexion uh, plus um, uh, knee extension plus hip extension. So there's the squat part, right? So there's the triple extension we talked about. Uh, and then at the shoulders, uh, it's going to be all the same things as the bench press. So horizontal adduction plus elbow extension. So total body movement. There's also going to probably be some, you know, spinal flexion and, and stuff like that there, or I'd rather spinal extension uh, stuff there as well because you got to stand back up so here's why we did this here's here's what's kind of here's why we did this um let's break all this down and take a look at these so you might be thinking let's say uh uh, uh the dumbbell chest fly for instance because that's just a single thing here i label all of these and you might be thinking well what about like if i'm doing a chest fly it looks like this Right? I'm doing a full range of motion on the rep. So while this is horizontal adduction, aren't I also doing horizontal abduction during the fly? I'm going this way, aren't I also going this way because I got to relax? Absolutely. But 
when we label our movements, we label it when the muscle is actively pulling, okay? Which is what's going to take us into our next section here. Um, we label it when the muscle is shortening, not when the muscle is lengthening. From our perspective, when we're talking about what a muscle does, we are describing what it does when the muscle pulls, not when it holds or when it lengthens, right? So if I were putting a box on a shelf, I would shorten my muscles to put it up there. Now, obviously I could lower it down as well, or I could just hold it, right? But I would label the movement based on when I am pushing against the box to place it up above, not when I'm relaxing the box to lower it down. When the muscle shortens or when the muscle actively pulls, that's how we label our exercises. That's how we label our joint movements, not when the muscle is lengthening to relax. Everybody clear on that? We'll no, just explain it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? So how do I, yeah, absolutely. So a bicep curl is elbow, because that's the joint that's moving, flexion. Why, but obviously during the bicep curl, I'm doing flexion and extension. So when I label the movement, when I label what that exercise, what exercise is doing what, I'm labeling it during the concentric, we're gonna see those actions in a second, during the shortening, right? You can see my bicep like bunching up, right? So it's bunching up because it's working against gravity and because the muscle's shortening. All the fibers are sliding across, so they're, they're shortening, right? So we label it during the shortening portion of the lift, not during the relaxation portion of the lift. So the reason a squat is triple extension, not triple flexion, right? Because I do descend into triple flexion, but I ascend in triple extension. I shorten my muscles during triple extension. Obviously, the run. Let's go back to, uh, let's go back to the man, freaking Bolt, fastest guy on the planet. Um, obviously, running is two parts, right? It's it's relaxing and contracting. So we label it during the contracting portion. So this is hip extension, this is knee extension, this is plantar flexion, not the relaxation leg, which is the flexion, flexion, and, and flexion, which we call dorsiflexion, right? Um, so uh, all of these movements, <clears throat> all of these exercises work in these directions, Every one of these that I listed is the pulling part of the lift. Let's look at the burpee, which is the most complicated one, right? So that's ankle plantar flexion because during a burpee, you get the jump at the end, right? And the clap. So I jump, so my toes point away, plantar flexion, right? Meanwhile, my knees straighten, so knee extension. My hips straighten, that's hip extension. My arms push away, right? So that would be horizontal adduction. It's elbow extension, right? During the active part, during the contracting part. So that's how we label all these exercises. Um, that's how we're going to always label any movement. It's always during the shortening of the muscle that moves the joint uh, actively rather than passively. Um, so Marvin, I mean, you're, you're, you're a much bigger guy than I am. If the two of us were in a uh, uh, sumo wrestling match <laughs> and we're trying to push each other out the ring and I'm flexion and your extension, you're probably going to be able to just walk forward <laughs> and I'm going to be overtaken. You're going to shorten while I'm lengthening, right? So if you're flexion and I'm extension, that movement would be considered flexion. You'd be shortening to overcome me. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you so much for that breakdown. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Um, so 
Uh, there is there are there is one slide that I, I didn't get to really quickly. Um, the scapular movements, your scapula uh, is also kind of hanging off your body at sort of a right angle. Your, so your scapula kind of like hangs off you on this side. So they get some special terms as well um, that are just there to kind of stabilize during all of these other major movements we talked about. So uh, you have scapular retraction, which is the scapula moving closer together. It's actually an example you can see right, the scapula kind of moves backwards and, and closer to the midline. So scapular retraction is actually an example of adduction, right, because it's coming inward toward the midline, uh, whereas scapular uh, protraction, where the scapula rounds around the front of the body, uh, would be an example of them moving away. So that's actually lateral. Um, but we don't use those terms. We just call it scapular retraction because retraction doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, and then we have scapular protraction, doesn't exist anywhere else. So uh, we just give it its own special term. So retraction is pulling your shoulder blades back, protraction is rounding them forward. Uh, and then we have scapular depression and elevation. So scapular elevation is going up, scapular depression is going down, okay? Uh, and those are the, the special scapula terms. They're just there to happen when we're moving the arm around. Right. So if you're doing a row, let's say I just I go like this and I do my rows this way. Yeah, that's not how we row. <laughs> so it should be this way, but also I should also retract my scapula instead of keeping it protracted. Um, because that's going to be a very inefficient movement otherwise. <laughs> um uh okay, muscle actions. So we already kind of dived into this a little bit. I kind of dived into this a little bit already by looking at uh, uh, the example of like the lengthening and the shortening and stuff. So um, we got three directions that our muscles are going to move in. We got three types of contractions that our muscles are going to do. Um, so uh, um, come on, give me a minute. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Uh, actually, no, I just want a picture that's like a little clear. This picture here is great. Uh, you know what, we'll just use this one. It's just not quite as exaggerated as much as I'd like it to be. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, three different ways that our muscles are going to contract. Okay. Three parts to every lift out there in the gym, unless it's like a, you know, an isometric exercise, like a plank or something. But there's going to be three parts to every movement of a muscle. So your muscles can do three things. Uh, let's go back to our day on muscles though, right? Let's go back to when we talked about the sliding filament model, right? Um, the muscle was crawling, it was sliding, causing the muscle to shorten. That was the active portion of what's happening in every muscle cell. But then the muscle needs to like go back and relax back into place. So that's the other thing it can do. Remember muscles can't push the opposite direction. They can pull and they can relax, but obviously they can also just kind of stay put as well. So there's your three muscle actions and it is happening at a cellular level, right? Um, but it happens in so many cells simultaneously that the entire muscle does move. So we'll go ahead and start with uh, uh, the part that most people are actually familiar with, um, which is not the order that NASM is going in, but we'll start with the concentric part. So I'll come back up to the other parts in, bit, in just a bit. So when the muscle is shortening, that's probably what you think of. When you think of like a muscle contracting, you're probably thinking of when the muscle is short. Um, and generally that's how I describe it too. Like when I'm talking to my clients, I'm like, contract your muscle. I mean, you know, pull it. Um, uh, but technically there are three types of contractions. So concentric contractions are contractions that occur when the muscle is shortening. So we can see the picture here, right? See how the muscles all bunched up? That compared to like this, where it's kind of pulled apart, that's a concentric contraction, okay? So let's take a look at that uh, in like, at a, at like a cellular level, right? Um, mm, now, in this picture, this is actually describing a bad length tension relationship. So just go ahead and ignore what these are labeled as. 
But here's a muscle contracted concentrically. All the proteins have already slid, right? And that's why it bunches up, by the way. So if we look at like our muscles, right? You can see right now my muscles kind of pulled apart. But if I bunch it up like that, right, they all kind of come together and they slide across one another, bunches up. That's the concentric portion of the lift. I shortened my muscle. And because I shortened it and it's attached here and it's attached over here, what did it do? It dragged the elbow with it, right? Um, and that's what's happening. Concentric contractions produce movement. So they are force production. Uh, it is when the muscle is generating a greater amount of force than whatever resistance it's working against. So again, uh, let's go back to our like sort of sumo wrestling analogy, right? Um, I'm going to try to concentrically push as hard as possible, right? But if someone's pushing me backwards, <laughs> right, I'm trying to concentrically produce force, but I'm not able to. And that's kind of what's happening in muscles. Uh, that are screwing up our joints, right? When we look at like an altered posture, what we're seeing is one muscle on one side of the joint that is concentrically contracting more than it's supposed to. And then the muscle on the other side of the joint is being pulled into uh, too much length um, uh, in response. Okay, so there's too much concentric contracting over here and not enough concentric contracting over here. So of our three muscle actions, concentric contractions are the shortening action. They're the force production action. They're generating more force than whatever resistance they're working against. I got a five pound dumbbell in my hand. I generate five, six pounds of force. The muscle can shorten. Now, if all of a sudden that dumbbell became 80 pounds, right? I'm holding this 80 pound dumbbell like this. I'm probably going to be like, oh, <laughs> right? It's going to lengthen my muscle. Okay. It's going to, it's going to reduce. I'm going to try to reduce the force so I don't drop it all the way to the floor and just slam it onto the ground. I'm going to try to control the reduction. Uh, well, that is the opposite. That is an eccentric contraction. So eccentric contractions are the opposite of concentric contractions. They are contractions that occur when a muscle is lengthening. So again, if my muscles all, good Lord, I almost tipped over my chair. So I got my muscle all shortened up and bunched up like this, right? And then I lengthen it out. That's an eccentric contraction. Okay. You can see that here in the picture, right? So a concentric contraction is creating movement, it's producing movement, and eccentric contractions are reducing movement. Again, let's go back to the box, right? I got a box here, I'm trying to put it up onto a shelf. I need to concentrically produce that force in order to put the box up there. If I'm trying to pull it down, I need to eccentrically lower it down. Okay, I'm reducing the force. Okay, uh, or you know, it's it's kind of easier to remember. Uh, let's say the box fell off the shelf and I'm catching it, right? I'm gonna kind of cradle it, right? I'm reducing its force. It's like it's you know picking up speed, then it touches my hand, and now it's slowing down. I'm reducing its force. Okay, uh, pumping the brakes, slowing it. So. Um, so concentric contractions, the muscle shortens. Eccentric contractions, the muscle lengthens. So let's go back to looking at what's happening in the cells, right? So up here at the top, right? If I go from here where they're all contracted, and then I go to here where they're all lengthened, okay? I, I, I pull the fibers apart. The troponin and tropomyosin, they, they start blocking the body. Everything goes back into place. That's eccentric. So force reduction. The muscle is generating less force than a resistance. You know, if I got a five pound dumbbell and I curl it, right? I produced force, that's concentric. And when I relax the muscle, that's eccentric. So, you know, I've got five pounds in my hand, I generate four pounds of force. Um, now again, go back to what I just said a minute ago. We don't label our joint actions 
based on when the muscle's reducing force. We label them based on when the muscle's producing force. So why was the, uh, 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 the lateral row, um, you know, the, the wide grip row, why was that horizontal abduction? Because obviously I have to, you know, I have to relax the other way, right? I have to relax it back down. Well, I don't label it based on when it's relaxing. I label it based on when it's actively contracting. So that's the force production part of the movement. Therefore, that movement is called abduction because it's the force production part. Uh, and then obviously every exercise has to have a middle section, right? Uh, when we're switching in between, and maybe we have a pause. Oh yeah, uh, sorry, before I move on. Question, what's up? Uh, what about back squat? When we do back, back squat with the uh, dumbbell? Like with, uh, with the dumbbell, uh, what's well, with uh, the weight, like, um, yeah. You mean like a barbell on your back? Barbell, yes, barbell. Yeah, so yeah, uh, classic back squat, right? Um, yeah, so that would be, I'd be reducing force as I go down towards the ground and I'd produce force as I come up, right? So what actions are happening during the force production part of the lift, right? So that's ankle plantar flexion, uh, it's knee extension, extension yeah. and it's hip extension, extension. so triple extension, oh, okay. all squats. All squat variations are triple extension. Okay. Uh, even lunges, lunges, step ups. Uh, um, yeah, a step up to balance or like a step up and stuff like that's uh, the same as a squat action. Do you remember last mod I talked about like teaching your clients those kind of five key patterns, hinge pattern, squat pattern? Yes. Lunges, um, step ups, squats, obviously, uh, even the burpee earlier all of those fall into that squat pattern category. Okay. Um, yeah, good question. Thank you. Uh, you can add the back squat to the list. <laughs> yeah, love that. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> so uh, we'll see it's the same thing. Ah. Oh my God, buttons. Um, so again, uh, plantar flexion, knee extension, hip extension. Um, so, uh, isometric movements. Isometric movements are in the middle. So, isometric movements are contractions that take place where there is no change in the length of the muscle. So, the muscle's length remains constant. Um, so, think of it as like, um, and, and isometric contractions can take place at any section of the muscle. I can obviously hold here, 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 right? Anywhere where I'm holding, right? So that's an isometric contraction. A plank is an isometric exercise. Uh, a wall sit is an isometric exercise. Anything where I'm holding my place, right? So uh, that's always kind of hard to draw because you're like, all drawings are kind of static, but um, so you can see that one right here. Uh, he, you know, the arrow is not, shortening, the arrow is not lengthening, um, it's just kind of staying put, that's an isometric contraction, okay? So isometric contractions occur when your muscle is maintaining length. Um, it's force stabilization, you know? Um, I talk about this a lot whenever I'm talking about the core. I talk about how important isometric strength is in your core, because you need your core to be able to stay put which is why I always, I, you hear me, I, this is like becoming a catchphrase of mine, I feel like. Um, but a lot of people think exercise is all about movement. And don't be wrong, exercise has a lot of movement in it, right? But imagine like how much movement is happening during a run. Let's say you're running, right? But you need to also stabilize your spine. Your spine's not meant to really move during a run. It's meant to stay there while the stuff below it moves, you know? Um, so I would argue, exercising is just as much about like learning how to not move on purpose as much as it is about learning how to move properly. Or we could put it a different way to, to be a little bit more descriptive. Exercise is just about just as much about resisting unwanted movement as it is about like producing wanted movement, you know? 
Um, and that's where isometric exercise kind of really comes in. So isometric contractions occur when the muscle is, is maintaining a specific length, okay? Uh, this is force stabilization. So we had force production, force reduction, uh, and we have force stabilization. Um, it's generating an equal amount of force to whatever it's resisting. So obviously, uh, uh, let's say I go try to push my house down with my hands, right? I'm like, I'm done with this house. I'm gonna push it down. I'm, I'm renting, so this would be something I shouldn't do. Uh, <laughs> but let's say, like, I'm like, and I just push as hard as I can. Now I am trying to concentrically produce enough force to push my house down, right? It's not gonna happen. Um, so because it's not gonna happen, the house is pushing just as much force against me. So it is an isometric contraction. Now you might be thinking, well, wouldn't that be concentric because you're trying to produce as much force as possible? Yes, I am trying to, but it's impossible. So it is still an isometric contraction because the length of my muscles is locked in a specific length. I'm not overcoming, I'm not producing movement. The muscle's length is staying the same. So, um, now there is a special term. I put this in the notes now. This is not in this chapter, um, but I did put it in the notes now because it's gonna become very important at the end of the module. So this is a little, little Brad note in here. Um, there is a special version of isometric contractions that we gotta talk about called amortization. Um, anybody out there who has ever bought a house, by the way, um, speaking of houses, um, if any of you have ever bought a house, you actually might be familiar with the term amortization. Um, if I Google amortization, I'll bet I'll actually get a real estate picture. Yep. <laughs> uh, some big fancy, some big fancy math here, but it always looks like, uh, it always looks like this. It's a little chart here. Um, so this is actually looking at a loan. <laughs> amortization, when we're talking about like money, is the transition time from where your house is basically like, you know, you're losing money because, you know, you're spending money on the payments, but the value of your house keeps going up over time. So eventually there's like a tipping point where your house is making you money. Uh, so the transition time between losing money and making money, the transition time is known as the amortization of your loan. Um, so, why am I talking about this? Because I am so far from a financial expert, it's not even funny. Uh, <laughs> it's, a very, it's very analogous to what we're talking about. It's the transition time of the loan. Amortization, when we're talking about it, is the transition time between concentric and eccentric. So if my squat looks like this, That was a really <laughs> long transition. Uh, not very explosive, right? But if my squat looked like this, do you see how like I couldn't even control myself? Do you guys notice how I popped up to my toes for a second there? I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> it just happened because I transitioned so quickly, right? It got very bouncy. And the reason it got so bouncy, is uh, one of the most important concept of this module. Um, it got really bouncy because I did my eccentric portion so freaking fast, my nervous system actually panicked for a second. And it was like, ah, and it pulled back in the opposite direction. We want, if the transition time is really short, we have a special term for it. We call it amortization. So normally the transition between lengthening and shortening, we'd call it isometric. It's a, it's a pause between the rep, right? It would be this, little pause. But if, it, if, it's, if the transition is so fast that it's not really a pause anymore and it's just a like blip, we have a special term that we call amortization. Amortization is the stabilizing transition between eccentric and concentric or concentric and eccentric, right? Uh, it's very important when we're talking about plyometrics. If we want to be explosive, we need the transition time to be as short as possible. Like just think about playing sports, right? Think about like playing defense, right? Um, again, terrible basketball player, but the example is going to be good. 
So if I got a basketball, right? And I'm trying to do like a crossover, God forbid. Uh, <laughs> um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna like, I'm gonna bounce it over here. And then I'm going to like, I'm faking like I'm going over here. What I really wanna do is I wanna go over there. So then I go back this way. Now the person guarding me, they're gonna go with me, right? And they're gonna try to stay in front of me because they don't want me to go over there, right? They're playing defense. So whichever of the two of us is able to transfer the fastest, that's gonna be the person who gets there first. So whoever has a shorter amortization is more explosive and therefore has an advantage in athletics. And that's why we're actually gonna train explosively. We're gonna train to learn how to transition as fast as possible at the end of the mod. Um, so I put this in here now, even though it's not in this chapter, the, the middle portion of a rep is isometric. But if that isometric is like at the speed of light, we call it amortization. We call it the, the actual transition time. Um, but three types of contractions. Let's summarize up this section really quick and review. Three types of contractions. There's the shortening, there's the isometric portion in the middle, and then there's the lengthening, okay? Um, and those are your three muscle contractions. So when we look at somebody who's goofed up their posture, we're not seeing, let's say this is my biceps and my triceps, right? We're not seeing an even distribution of strength between the biceps and the triceps, right? This is good posture here, right? This bone is not being swung in either direction. Uh, <laughs> but what we are seeing in, a, in bad posture, right? Is we're seeing one muscle that's too shortened on one side of the joint. So it's concentrically contracting too much. Meanwhile, the antagonist muscle on the other side of the joint is eccentrically lengthening. Again, if I'm supposed to you know, be on a seesaw with someone and that person just stays put on the ground, I can't get back down. <laughs> they have all the leverage, right? So if they stay shortened, I have to stay lengthened. I have no control over it. So the seesaw is goofed up. And it's, it's, you know, and that eventually causes aches and pains and grinding and, you know, all kinds of problems in our posture. So a lot of what we do when we are doing fitness assessments is we look at somebody's posture and we go, okay, they're doing too much of this and they're doing not enough of this. And so we are going to train to do the opposite. But in order to be able to do that, we have to have a very specific way to, to kind of describe these movements. And, you know, we need to know what muscles do what. Uh, does that make sense, everybody? Yes. yes. Cool. Any questions at all? I'm good. Love that. Uh, all right. So uh, now we get into just some, some honestly, some easier stuff. <laughs> it's a lot of terminology, but like it's all related to what we've talked about now. So that was all our foundational stuff. Um, the rest of this kind of relies on, on understanding that. So um, let's go ahead and, and, and look at... Um, how we define like, you know, producing force and stuff, right? Um, so we're talking about like force in a muscle. Um, we're talking about like, you know, we, we generate force. Force is, is uh, what's the definition? It's, uh, we, we don't, you don't need to know this by the way. I mean, you need to know this, but you don't need to have it. It's not a definition that you tested on. Uh, it's the interaction between two entities that either accelerates or decelerates one of those entities. It's the most confusing freaking, way to word it ever. But here's what force is. Force is something that either produces movement or reduces movement, okay? So if I'm producing force, I am moving something. If I'm reducing force, I am slowing something down. Guess what? That's concentric or it's eccentric. And then like technically force can be used to, to stabilize as well. Um, you know, light side, dark side, neutral side <laughs> of the force, <laughs> right? Um, uh, uh, it really, you know, it really does kind of kind of follow Star Wars pretty well. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, we have to look at like uh, the relationship between like, you know, where we're producing force. So um, when we're looking at this, there's a term that we're going to see a lot. Uh, known as a length 
tension relationship. And what it's describing is the length at which the muscle is where it can produce tension. Now, ideally, we want to have a, a good length tension relationship. Okay. We want to have an ideal length tension relationship because muscles, because they are overlapping proteins. I mean, if, if muscles were not just like overlapping proteins, it wouldn't work this way. Um, but because our muscles are made of like little proteins that have to be able to like crawl on one another and they have to slide, right? We need to have them resting at the ideal length. You know, um, like imagine if I were if I were testing the speed at which like Simon and I can both run, right? I'm like, hey Simon, we're gonna have a test today, and we're gonna test how fast you can run versus how fast I can run. And I give myself like a hundred meters of length. Uh, to run. And I'm like, and I give Simon like five meters of length to run. <laughs> right. And it's like, I'm going to test your top speed versus mine. And I got all this distance to be able to sprint and run. And he gets like, you know, a couple feet, right. It's not a very fair test, you know, because he's not going to have any time to speed up. He's not going to be able to get to his top speed because he doesn't have enough room. Right. So he's over shortened. So he's going to lose his ability to like pick up speed. Me, I've got like all this distance. So I got plenty of room to pick up speed. But now what if we change the parameters of our test? And I say, we're going to test the average speed in order to determine who's fastest. Well, if I run a mile and he runs five meters, both of us are screwed. You know, both of these are bad situations, right? Because like if I run a mile, I probably got to go really fast at one point, but then as like I got like longer and longer, I started getting tired. So I started slowing down. So my whole average started dropping and then he didn't have any room to go. So he never got a chance to pick up speed. You know, his average is probably pretty constant, you know, um, but he never really had anywhere to go. So over, over shortening the distance is going to screw up our statistics over lengthening the distance is going to screw up our statistics so what we want is a perfect blend right in the middle this is actually where the 100 meter dash came from 100 meter dash is a sport you know it's just short enough to be able to sprint the entire thing so it is a test of direct speed now a 400 meter dash is pretty similar, but because it gets a little, it's just longer in distance. Well, it, you know, it's 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 almost a test of endurance. It's still very much a speed thing, but it's almost a little bit of endurance, right? And a marathon is not a test of speed; it's a test of endurance, right? They're different things. Um, so, in a muscle, a super shortened muscle is not a test of like force. It is a muscle that's contracting more than it's supposed to but it is losing major force production. And lengthening a muscle too much also costs force production. So look at this chart right here. You can see this red line is representing how much force you can generate in a muscle based on how long the sarcomere, the little fiber uh, inside the myofibrils is. If you've got it already too shortened, look at how much force it produces. It produces less force. But also look at if it's over lengthened. If you're pulling the fiber too length into too much length, it also cannot produce enough force. What we want is we want it to be in balance right in the middle. Shortening a muscle too much alters the length tension relationship. Lengthening a muscle too much alters the length tension relationship. Both are bad. Okay. So it's the length at which a muscle can produce the greatest amount of force. Again, this muscle fiber right here on this side of the joint is too short. And this side of the muscle fiber is too long. So what does that mean? It means it's weakened. And what does this one mean? Guess what? It's also weakened. <laughs> um, so a lot of times when I'm describing this stuff to my clients, I'll be pretty simple about it. I'll be pretty reductive. 
and I'll tell them, hey, you got one muscle fiber that's contracting too much and you got one muscle fiber that's not contracting enough and it's messing up your posture. Um, and if they want to interpret that as one muscle is too strong and the other one is too weak, um, I won't correct them. I think that's a good way to think of it in your head. However, if we're being scientifically accurate, both of them are weaker than they are supposed to be. It just means that this one's contracting too much, making it weaker. And this one's contracting not enough, making it weaker, right? Um, so lengthening a muscle beyond its optimal amount of actin and myosin overlap will result in a reduced force production. And shortening a muscle beyond its optimal actin and myosin overlap will also result in reduced force production. Um, so when I say a length tension relationship, I mean the length at which a muscle can produce the greatest amount of force. But on a cellular level, it is the greatest degree of overlap of actin and myosin. The actin and myosin have a good grip, but they don't have too much grip. Does that make sense, guys? Yes, sir. Cool. Sure do. Yeah. Love it. Um, so, uh, and by the way, this is how we're going to fix this, just for my new folks. Um, I know the rest of you have heard this a million times, especially lately. Um, but uh, just for my new folks, what this means, if the muscle's too short, that's, um, that's excessive concentric contracting, right? So what are we going to do to fix it? We're going to stretch them. <laughs> uh, this is a muscle that needs to be stretched because stretching is going to turn the muscle off. And that's what we're trying to do. It's overactive. Whereas over here, this needs to be uh, uh, strengthened, right? So that's an exercise. That's a muscle that we are actually going to actively contract. So, um, you know, if I look at a client whose uh, knees are caving in, right? We know that some of the muscles are pulling too much. Now that is excessive adduction. So I don't want to do adduction movements. I'm too good at it, right? I need to do more abduction movements. And that's how we, we look at people's posture to figure out what exercises to do for them. Luckily, NASM's done all this work for you. <laughs> uh, if you look at uh, the overhead, you look at NASM's overhead solutions table, they've got it actually listed for you. Um, sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, so knees cave in. All right, so knees cave in. Here's our list. Probable overactive muscles. These are all the muscles you need to stretch. And if the knees cave in, these are the muscles that are probably underactive. These are the ones that you need to strengthen. And there it is. That's, that's, that's how we fix it, you know? Um, and we'll be looking at that for the rest of the mod, you know, after, like, you know, we start meeting together and stuff. Um, all right, so uh, a couple other terms here. We've got force couples. Um, force couples, uh, uh, these are muscles that work together synergistically. So like, yeah, obviously, you know, all these exercises we picked earlier, right? Um, I didn't just list one thing happening. You know, I list multiple things happening, which means multiple muscles are working to make that happen. That's what we refer to as like a force couple. So force couples are muscles uh, uh, working together to produce that movement around a joint. So like if you're moving your scapula, right? Your upper trap pulls this way, your middle trap pulls this way, your lower trap pulls this way, and your serratus anterior pulls this way. Um, don't worry about it, I haven't those memorized just yet. But you can see, right, if I pull all three of those direct, or all four of those directions, it creates a rotary movement, you know, um, in, that, uh, in that, that bone. And that allows it to swing and now my, you know, my, my shoulder joint here, this little humerus bone is able to swing the way I want it to. So that's how force couples work. Um, it's kind of confusing because like to me, the word couple means two, but a force couple could be like a lot of muscles all at once. <laughs> it's a, it should be called a force, a couple, <laughs> force, a couple of muscles to work together. <laughs> um, 
And you can kind of see that happening again here, right? Multiple force couples. Now there is like, uh, when we're talking about like leverage and stuff, um, uh, you know, we'll talk, we've, we've talked about this in other classes and we'll talk about it more in, in different classes than this one. Um, but there is like a little bit of leverage. The further away the weight is from like where you are moving the joint, uh, the less leverage you have. Um, it creates what we call torque. So like uh, the further away something is, the harder it will feel because there's more torque. So for instance, like um, let's just say, uh, you know, I tape, or let's say I'm holding a dumbbell in my wrist here and I raise it, it's five pounds, right? So my arm is pretty far away from my shoulder. So there's more torque. Um, now let's say I tape that dumbbell to my elbow right here and do the same movement but it's at my elbow, there's gonna be less torque because it's closer to my shoulder joint than it was when it was over here. So uh, if I tape it to my elbow, this will feel easier to raise. Um, you can, you've felt this before. If you've ever tried to like hold a broomstick at the very, very end of it, and you try to like raise that broomstick, it will feel heavier than if you choke up on it, you know, in the middle, right? Or if you've ever played like Little League, you know, your coach will tell you to choke up on the bat it's because it reduces the torque. It makes the bat feel lighter and it's easier to swing it faster. Um, so that's what torque is. Um, don't worry about torque, this mod. It doesn't, it doesn't come up that often. Um, uh, but it is the reason why like certain exercises feel harder than others. Like everybody in here who's ever been like demoralized uh, by like, you know, you do like a chest fly and you've got like, you know, you're on like a chest fly machine and you put, you pull the pin and you put it on the like, you know, the 70 pound option or whatever. And you're like, yeah, I feel really strong. And then you flip it around and you do the reverse fly. <laughs> and it's like, whoop, that 70 just became five pounds. You know, uh, the reason why is because this muscle is so much longer than the little tiny muscle in the back. Um, so there's way more torque with that little tiny muscle. And that's why reverse flies are so much lighter than regular flies. And it's a real ego buster. <laughs> um, until you understand how torque works. <laughs> um, but don't worry, like I said, it's, it's not going to come up this month. So, um, okay. So um, let's go ahead and put all this together to, to talk about how we actually produce these movements, how we learn these movements. So we're going to call this our motor behavior, right? Proper form requires proper motor behavior. You have to learn how to do these movements correctly. So motor behavior is how your kinetic chain creates movements, how, how it learns movements, right? Um, and it's made up of a couple different things here. So like there's motor control, how your nervous system sort of takes in information and puts it together uh, in order to like produce the appropriate movement. Um, and then that changes over time. We call that our motor learning. So we'll, we'll come back to this um, in just a sec. The slide kind of circles back around. So when muscles work together as like a synergy, right? When like your lat knows to, to relax, you know, your lat muscles, which would be all of this, when they know to relax as you are pushing upwards, right? They're working like synergistically. Your lat doesn't just fully let go. It kind of pulls, but it pulls like lighter than, than the muscle that's sort of working against, right? Um, just like, you know, if you are um, uh, uh, moving like a couch through the door, right? You know, you got to like, thread it through. Like, I don't want to like, I'm lifting up here, but I might actually be pulling down a little bit here because it creates stability. So like, we don't just want one muscle to pull and the other muscle to just let go because then I wouldn't have any stability, right? So muscles are going to work synergistically together to produce movements simultaneously. And some of them might be pulling really hard in one moment and they might be relaxing in the next. So for instance, during a squat, right? Your glutes contract, your hamstrings contract and your quadriceps contract all simultaneously during that movement. But you might be thinking, it's like, aren't the quads and the hamstrings opposites of one another? Like, you know, this makes my knee swing forward. This one makes my knee swing back. They're totally antagonists. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where they're handing off control in different sections of the lift. So depending on what range of motion you are in, at any given time, the muscle might be contracting and then it you know, contracts more and more and more. And then you get to a specific range of motion 
and then it backs off and it contracts less and less and less and less. Um, and that's how your muscles like synergistically work together. Now, knowing how to do this properly is what comes in when we have our proprioception. Remember proprioception, that term we talked about when we talked about our nervous system? It's your body's understanding of where it is in space. You know, it needs to know uh, when to like let go and when to contract. But oftentimes our proprioception gets altered due to like, let's say, you know, I tear my hamstring at some point and then my immune system comes and repairs it. And so it puts scar tissue there, you know, uh, which is great because it fixes it and now it's stable and it's not going to rip in half, hopefully again. But the problem is like scar tissue is not very mobile. It's not very, you know, it's not able to relax very well. So, um, okay, so, so now I have altered proprioception because now my hamstring muscle, which used to be, let's say a foot and a half, is now only a foot and a quarter in length. So my brain doesn't know how to operate that. So it alters my movement patterns and makes me move in the wrong way. So we can screw up our proprioception because maybe we spend all day sitting. And now our body gets used to being in a hip flexed position, right? Um, you know, sitting in a chair. Look at this. This is hip flexion, right? The hip is flexed instead of being straight, right? It's knee flexion, right? And it's ankle plantar flexion, which is actually the opposite um, of what it would be if we were like in the middle of a squat. Um, this is actually kind of planted away, this is pointing away. Um, and so now the muscles that point my toe away, that's my calves, they're getting tight. Uh, the muscles that bend my knee, those hamstrings, they're getting tight. And the muscles that flex my hip, my hip flexors, they're getting tight, sitting all day. So our muscle just gets used to that and it alters our proprioception. And now our body goes, hey, I thought I couldn't stretch out that far. So then it feels tightness and it backs off and your body moves another joint instead in response. Altered proprioception is what alters our posture. Um, and that's how we end up thinking that this, actually, hey, I have a better one here. Uh, we start thinking that, uh, our brain starts thinking this is our actual posture, which it's not. This is our all actual posture. So if we stretch out the muscle, that restores length and it restores our proprioception. Um, but we need to know what, how to do it properly. So we have to assess our clients first. <laughs> we got to look at how they move so that I know how to you know, make them move the other way. Um, and that all comes together. We call that all of this, putting it all together, putting the strength and the stretching and all of it together. We call that sensory motor integration. Uh, it's your nervous system's ability to gather sensory information, interpret it, and then execute the appropriate response. So when we like, you know, um, try to have sensory motor integration, it's only ever going to be as good as the information coming in. So if you have bad proprioceptive information coming in, you know, you have a muscle saying, no, I can't stretch any further when in reality it can. Um, we have bad movement patterns. We have altered sensory motor integration. The body isn't aligned properly. It can't move properly. And it only gets worse and worse and worse over time, you know? Um, and that's where, you know, we're trying to, to kind of fix this through like, you know, altering our client's posture, right? Um, if we can get their posture back to like neutral, it will fix this. So that is where the motor learning comes back in. I told you it would circle back around. So <laughs> motor learning is practicing over time, proper movement patterns right? Um, those of you who have met with me before and you've been to like workshops with me, those of you who are in your final mods, you've experienced this a lot at this point, you know, we've looked at someone's posture and we've been like, okay, try this stretch. And then they stretch and they're like, oh my gosh, I feel more unlocked. I feel like I can move the right way, right? Now you would think that your brain would just go, oh, oh my gosh, that's how I'm supposed to move. Great. And then it would just remember it and do it every time. But your nervous system is stubborn. You know, <laughs> you know, it, it's not like, uh, I mean, how many of you guys have stretched and stretched and stretched and stretched to try to like fix your posture and it just doesn't get better. Well, that's for two reasons, right? Number one, 
if you're stretching only, which is what most people do, they stretch and they stretch and they stretch and they stretch, right? And their posture never gets better. Let's say you do restore the length of this muscle, right? You get it back to, you know, an ideal length, right? I'll, I'll kind of, I'll just like erase, you know, there we go. Now it's contracting as much as it's supposed to. You know, it's not, it's not an overly contracted muscle anymore, right? But that didn't fix the problem. Why not? Well, you got to pull it back the other way. You need to strengthen that muscle on the other side of the joint. That's going to restore length. We need these to both, you know, be contracting the same amount, right? If you only stretch the overactive muscle, you're not pulling it back the other way. It's like, you know, um, think of your shoelaces. Have you ever like left your shoelaces uh, tied in a knot for like a really long time? They kind of get used to being in that position. They kind of get little kinks in them. They're like kind of, your shoelaces are kind of crooked, right? So if you untie the knot, it still has all the kinks in it. You have to, you know, the only way you're going to straighten it out is like pull it end to end and like kind of work out those kinks. Um, so we need to strengthen the other side of the joint. So we're going to do that through practice. We're going to do that through like experience, right? So motor control is how your nervous system takes in information and motor learning is how it learns new skills. Um, so when we practice over and over and over and over and over, eventually our nervous system does learn how to do those movements for future use. So we, as the coach are going to help our client practice. And this is why trainers are so freaking picky. And that's like, no, that's not your squat. Push your knees out. No, no, no. Push your knees out. Every rep, we're going to remind our clients, right? That's called feedback. Now this is more of a coaching thing than an assessment thing. So I am moving through this kind of quick. Um, but feedback is going to use the sensory information um, and sensory motor integration. So like your brain feeling it and doing it simultaneously to learn how to change those movement patterns. So feedback is both internal and external. Um, now, external feedback is you and me, right? If I say, you know, if I'm like, hey, Cyrus, push your knees out. That's, he's hearing external feedback. Right? He's getting feedback from an external source. And that's great, it is helpful, because um, uh, it can help him like correct things. But if I don't get him to recognize it and feel the internal feedback, it's not gonna be as effective. So we need a good blend here, guys. Uh, when you're coaching your clients, don't just say things, don't just tell them what to do, tell them why to do it and get them to recognize the difference, right? That's like, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons why math is so hard for people to learn, and I'm, I'm one of those people, by the way, um, is because a lot of times, like I, I was taught to like memorize my times tables, you know? Six times six is 36, six times seven, right? Just work my way up, you know, the times tables. Uh, and that's fine. I think it, you know, it was okay. Um, but I think like it instilled in me at a young age that like memorization is the best way to like learn information. Because if I memorized, I would pass the tests, you know? Um, but that's, that's like all external feedback. You know, I didn't take the time to- Western uh, education. Yeah, Western education. It really is. Yeah, you're 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 right on. Um, I didn't take the time to learn why those are the right answers, and that's you know that's we do. And, and don't get me wrong, like memorization is part of learning. It is a a tool to be used. You know, can't learn things without knowing an alphabet. You know what I mean? Um, you can't you can't read words without knowing the alphabet first. Um, which is why like, you know, the way the Sochi program is kind of constructed, right? We do give you a lot of like memorization ability with like retaking your homeworks and stuff like that. Um, but what's gonna help you guys so much more, um, actually uh, 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 Desiree, our, one of our new students, she had a really great question. She's like, hey, she was like the first day or maybe the second day. And she was like, what is your best tip for like absorbing this information? And I always tell people the best way to do it is like, Imagine if you had to recreate an explanation for someone else. It helps you have like a different understanding on the thing. So that's like the internal feedback for your client, okay? So internal feedback is information that your client can feel the difference of, you know? Like, just try this out, guys. Like squat and give yourself a little bit of an excessive forward lift. Like squat by just sticking your butt out and feel how that is versus when you drop down 
into an actual squat with your chest up a little bit higher and your butt sitting back. Feel the difference. And you're like, oh man, that's totally different, you know? So we can only give our clients external feedback as the trainer. You know, I can't get into my client's brain and poke the neurons that are going to help them feel the difference. I can't be like this one, you know, <laughs> I can't do that. Right. I can only give them external feedback, but we know internal feedback is super important. So when you are giving your client external feedback, what you want to do is you want to give them no, both knowledge of their performance and knowledge of their results. So what that is, is like, you're going to tell your client, Hey, good rep, which is knowledge of performance. But then you want to explain to them why it was a good rep. So saying like, hey, you did a very good job there, knowledge of performance, by keeping your knees pushed out into that external rotation. That's knowledge of results. Um, that's why it was a good rep. Good job because X, Y, and Z. And then even better, you want to make sure that they are noticing internal feedback and why it's different. So what you want to do is like, oftentimes like the reason you guys hear me say uh, any questions or you'll hear me say, um, did that make sense? Right. And, or uh, uh, afterwards, I'll usually follow that up with, um, do you guys see how the, you guys see the difference, right? That like noticing of the difference between the two is what's important for like memorize, you know, feel and like memorizing the difference, right? So we say, good job, because you pushed your knees out, did you feel how that was different than your first set? And if you do those, if you coach like that, it will encourage your client to not only recognize what is a good rep, you'll get them to recognize why it was a good rep, and you will teach them how to recognize the feeling later so that they'll do it consistently. And then it will get better over time. It will change and get better and better and better and better and better as their brain realizes, oh, that feels so much better. That's how I'm supposed to move, you know? <laughs> um, so all that stuff is important, uh, but I did, you'll, you, I, I, I rushed this last portion um, because it's not as relevant right now in the assessments class. Um, really right now, we just want you guys to kind of get an understanding. If you, if you focus on these notes later today, guys, uh, I really want you to kind of stay in the first half. Um, this down to like length tension relationships, like muscle actions, um, concentric, eccentric, isometric, and length tension relationships. That's the important part. Uh, we will teach you force couples and stuff and how they work together in like program design classes and like which exercises are doing which things and stuff. Um, this is important. But it's, it's like, uh, that really is like the, the kind of the Mo section where he's like teaching you guys like, you know, which exercises are best for blah, 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 right? Um, whereas we're doing very foundational knowledge now. I want you to know it all. Uh, but knowing it all is like, it's a lot to cram in all at once. <laughs> um, so start, start with the first half, I would say. Um, and you'll notice, like you'll, you'll notice it today because we got um, homework two is going out today um because we're on day four so homework two is going out today um you will notice pretty much all the questions are from the first half of this powerpoint not not well and and friday's powerpoint um <laughs> the questions from today's powerpoint are from the first half of it <laughs> is what i mean to say um but as i usually do uh any questions today guys questions comments concerns No, I think we're good. Cool. Bit of a longer lesson. I, uh, I appreciate you guys sticking with me today. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a little brain foggy, so I got a little extra distracted sometimes today. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so I'm going to keep you guys posted. Um, like I said, I've been COVID testing like crazy since Friday. Uh, COVID negative, but I am coming down with a little bit of a cold. I'm like in the middle of like the good part of cold medicine right now. I feel great. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna feel rough again in like another two hours. Um, but um, I'm gonna keep COVID testing, uh, but I may, I, I don't like to do this, especially like, especially cause it's our first in-person meetup. Um, but I may have Mo sub in for me 
I'm going to reach out to him actually after class right now um, and see if he might be able to take over my lesson on Wednesday. Um, but uh, hopefully I won't have to do that. Um, and you'll see me just, you know, I'll be masked up. I'm going to keep COVID tests. I'm going to do a COVID test the morning of uh, our meetup and stuff. And I'll do one, obviously, to uh, do an, an, another one to, tomorrow. Um, but I'll keep you guys informed whether or not that happens. Um, so just keep, a, keep an eye on the emails. Um, you know, email number four is going to go out today because it's day four. Uh, it is your last homework before the midterm. Um, so you will get homework two up on Canvas today. Um, so knock it out. And now that you've got those two components, you've got homework one and homework two, you can start studying and uh, get ready for the test on Wednesday. Test. The big homework. We should just call it big homework. Less intimidating. Uh, all right, guys. Let me kill the recording.